वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर नीरू टंडन फ्रॉम वी एस एस डी कॉलेज कानपुर वी आर डिस्कसिंग पेपर थर्ड नाइनटींथ सेंचुरी इंग्लिश लिटरेचर एंड दिस मॉड्यूल ऑन पी बी शेले एंड इज पोएम्स वॉज रिटन बाय डॉक्टर जबा कुसुम सिंह पी बी शेले और परसी बायस शेले as his full name is is an important literary figure in the history of english literature 19th century also known as romantic age or the literature written over there is known as romantic literature is very important as far as the historical preview is concerned the romantics they are divided into two groups elder romantics and younger romantics wordsworth and coleridge they belong to the elder romantics in the same way shelley along with byron and keats occupy the younger romantics group now shelley who has written some very beautiful poems and some of the lines from his poems are proverbial who can forget his lines and his messages given through his poems so let's talk about and discuss in this module about the poet p b shelley some of his important poems especially ode to the west wind and critically analyze his poetic style p b shelley was born in broadbridge heath england on august 4th 1792 his parents were timothy shelley a square and member of parliament and elizabeth pilfold he was expelled from university college oxford for co-authoring a pamphlet the necessity of atheism Shelley had two wives Harriet and Mary Lord Byron and John Keats were his close associates Godwin was his mentor and on 8th July 1822 Shelley was drowned in a sudden storm on the Gulf of Spezia and died His poems have powerful symbols that are his visionary pursuit of the ideal His images are balanced by a deep philosophy. His thought is represented by an assertion on taking the contentious side of matter. His first long serious work known as Queen Mob is a philosophical poem. In 1818 he wrote The Revolt of Islam and then 1820 Prometheus Unbound they are considered as his masterpieces. His supreme unmitigated lyrics are the odes like Ode to the West Wind. He also wrote a drama and the name of that drama was The Cenci and it was written in 1819. His A Defense of Poetry one of the most eloquent justifications of poetry ever written is there with us as a masterpiece. Shelley's last long poem the triumph of life achieved a style and vision superior to all other writings in various era the critics criticized him in deviating ways carlyle and emerson belittled him arnold called him beautiful and ineffectual angel beating in the void his luminous wings in vain while William Michael Rossetti called Shelley's works an added a memoir. He also edited his works. Yeats was influenced by Shelley's visionary poetics and his symbol making. His admirers include men like Poe, Swinburne, George Eliot, George Lewis, Thomas Hardy, Newman, Carlos Baker, Bloom, Kenneth Cameron. Donald Raymond Timothy Webb and others 
T.S. Eliot and F.R. Lewis criticized him severely. Now, when we talk about the poetic technique of P.B. Shelley, the most important features of his poetry cannot be overlooked and they are his use of symbols, visionary elements, mythic sources and the elucidation of his poems. The readers are transcended into a limitless and fantastic world of emotions and imaginations through his poetry and it was possible because of his poetic technique. Shelley's first publication was a gothic novel, Gestrosity. It was in 1810. He was an adventure loving person. He wrote political pamphlets and specifically common people know him because of his ode and that is ode to the West Wind which was written in 1819 near Italy, Florence and it was published in 1820. This poem spreads the message of reform and revolution. The wind becomes the trope for spreading the word of change. It allegorizes the role of the poet as the voice of change and revolution. The poem refers to Peterloo Mascara of 1819. It consists of five sections written in Tarzarima. It has four terses and a rhyming couplet. The ode is written in iambic pentameter. This is a beautiful ode and it has been divided in two parts. The first three cantos are about the eminence of the wind and the last two cantos show a relation between the wind and the speaker. To poet, nature has triple power of devastating, conserving and then reconstructing. As you know, being a romantic poet, his description of nature is noteworthy. He appeals West Wind to bestow upon him some of its power. The west wind shall enthuse him to write poetry which the word would read and be spiritually renewed. Shelley in this poem describes all element of universe. First about the leaves which are earthy stuff, then the clouds which are the sky stuff and thirdly the water. So in this way earth sky and water all are included in this particular poem with different connotations. He had different messages and he has a different purpose to include all the three. He appeals the west wind to help him to awaken the mankind. He indulges in wish thinking without seeming to. He reinforces the virtue of hope in himself and says, O wind! If winter comes, can spring be far behind? Such a beautiful message. If winter comes, can spring be far behind? It is a message for all the men who are weary, who are troubled, who think that I am in problem. And this is a message given by Shelley that if you are in problem, then the good things are following definitely. So if winter is representing the problems and spring is representing the good things. So it's a revolutionary process. If winter comes, then spring is automatically there to follow that. The poem is the best example of Shelley's poetic genius. I quote some beautiful lines from the poem itself. Shelley said, Make me thy lyre even as the forest is. What if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumn tone. Sweet though in sadness be thou spirit fires, my spirit be thou me impetus one. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. 
and by the incantation of this words scatter as from an unextinguished hearth ashes and sparks my words among mankind be through my lips to unawakened earth now you see he said that he wants that his thoughts should be scattered they should reach to universe the way what wind does whatever the dry leaves are there and shelley's thoughts are compared with dry leaves so in the same way wind should scatter those dry leaves and in this way people who are living in far off places will also come to know about shelley's thoughts he said again in the poem the trumpet of a prophecy o wind if winter comes can a spring be far behind so it is a poem now after this poem another poem we are going to discuss is ode to a skylark ode to a skylark is a poem completed in late june 1820 and published accompanying ode to the west wind and his lyrical drama prometheus unbound it was inspired by an evening walk in the country near livorno italy with his wife mary shelley The poem is written in five line stanzas all 21 of them follow the same pattern the first four lines are metered in trochaic trimeter the fifth in iambic hexameter and the rhyme scheme of each stanza is extremely simple it is a b a b b the central subject of this song of skylark is a state of purified existence It is quite nearer to Wordsworthian notion of complete unity with heaven through nature. This song is inspired by the joy of the simple purity of being. It is unadulterated with any hint of melancholy or of bitter sweet as human joy so often is. Shelley used inspiring metaphor by creating an atmosphere of make believe now in this poem the bird skylark is not a mortal one at all but a spirit a poet hidden in the light of thought it reminds the readers of keats nightingale the poem of shelley is unique both structurally and linguistically The verses create the effect of a spontaneous poetic phrase flowing melodiously and naturally from the poet's mind. Structurally, each stanza is apt and makes a single quick point about the skylark. The reader here feels that he is one with the poet. He feels as if whatever poet is saying he can also experience that he can also feel that that is the beauty of the romantic poetry it just energizes all your senses the picaresque description of watching the skylark flying and envying its untrammeled inspiration is unique to shelley the skylark is a blithe spirit the mortals are unknown to the significance of this heavenly creature for it is matchless the poet makes use of various similes to describe the beauty of the song of skylark nothing matches the incomparable beauty of the melodiousness of the bird's song to shelley the sweetest songs are those that tell of the saddest thoughts now just try to understand this point of view of shelley sweetest songs are those that tell us you about the saddest thought now when you can sing your sadness then definitely it will be sweet for you that you are not being affected by your sadness it is so sweet to sing of the saddest thought so that it means that you have reached to a higher level to the poet the bird is important the poet says that its music is at par it is the best among all music and all poetry 
the poet wishes to sing a song as mesmerizing as the song of this kailak he so influenced by the song of this kailak just he again and again he just reminds us of keats nightingale he wants the word to witness the exceptionality of the song he has learnt from the skylark i quote some lines from this poem ode to skylark shelley said higher still and higher from the earth thou springest like a cloud of fire the blue deep thou wingest and singing still dost soar and soaring ever singest in the golden lightning of the sunken sun over which clouds are brightening thou dost float and run like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun so this bird skylark is not a simple bird it's a soul it's a spirit that can belong to anyone again he says the pale purple even melts around thy flight like a star of heaven in the broad daylight thou art unseen but yet i hear thy shrill delight now all the senses are working like a high born maiden in a palace star soothing her love laden soul in secret hour with music sweet as love which overflows her bar teach us a sprite or bird what sweet thoughts are thine i have never heard praise of love or wine that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine now you see in this poem that the poet is so rhythmic the rhyme scheme is perfect the lyrical quality is in abundance and you can enjoy the song you can sing the song as well as you can feel what poet wants to convey one more line from the poem what objects are the fountains of thy happy strain this line he puts a question what objects are the fountains of thy happy strain why you are so happy why are you singing such a sweet song is there no problem with you then he says what fields or waves or mountains what shapes of sky or plain what love of thine own kind what ignorance of pain so it is not possible that there is no pain in your life but still you are singing a song so why no sound no proof of pain is visible in your song your song gives happiness to the audience your song gives happiness whosoever listens that and finally a very famous poem in this poem it often becomes as a quote we look before and after and pine for what is not our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought this is the lesson that he has learned and says yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear if we were things born not to shed a tear i know not how thy joy we ever should come near now he also wants to be like a skylark he also wants that he should be happy and he should spread that happiness then finally he says and gives a request teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know you are so happy i admit i cannot become that happy but if i'll be very happy if you can teach me just the half of the gladness such harmonious madness from my lips would flow the world should listen then as i am listening now as i am ha- being happy i am listening that you are so happy and just singing a song in the same way when i will take this happiness from you when i will also sing a song of happiness and word will listen that song then everybody will be happy and i will be happy to spread this happiness in the whole world now another poem hymn to intellectual beauty it was written in 1816 and published in 1817 it is a 84 lines ode influenced by jean jacques rusher's novel julie and wordsworth's ode 
imitations of immortality. The central theme of this poem is spiritual power stands apart from both the physical world and the heart of man. It has seven long stanzas. Each line has an iambic rhythm. The first four lines of each stanza are written in pentameter. The fifth line in hexameter. The sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth and eleventh lines are in tetrameter and the twelfth line again in pentameter. Each stanza is rhymed A, B, B, A, A, C, C, B, D, D, E, E. The poem celebrates divine beauty. It's not the beauty of a girl. It's not beauty who is the ethereal, but the divine beauty. Shelley calls it intellectual beauty because intellect, he feels, comes from divine. And to him it is unknown and awful. It is an unpredictable visitor. The shadow of an invisible power floats among human beings, occasionally visiting human heart in various forms. Addressing this spirit of beauty, Shelley inquires where it has gone and why it leaves the world so desolate when it goes. The spirit inspires lovers and nourishes thoughts. The spirit's shadow fell across him only after he mused deeply in the lap of nature. Another romantic element in his poem. As an effect of the experience, he tells us in a stanza sixth, he promised to dedicate his powers to thee and thine. The spirit of beauty would free this world from its dark slavery. Shelley combined two of the major interests of his life, love of beauty and love of freedom. So all these three poems, they are just an example how Shelley has conveyed his poetic genius to the world. To sum up, we can again remind of Shelley's life. In such a short span of his life, he has given so much to the world, to the world of literature. Whatever he had, he wanted to share it with the world. His poetic capabilities are superb. His thoughts are the thoughts of genius. And as younger romantic, he had all the qualities in his poetry that should belong to a romantic poet. Along with his wife, Mary Shelley, he has contributed a lot to the world of literature. He enjoyed his work, he enjoyed his poems, but even then, he just sang the song of melancholy as well. Thank you for visiting EPG Patshala.